what a joy it is uh, for us to be worshiping together uh, in person. I know that there's only 50 people in here, uh, as that is our maximum capacity right now. Uh, and uh, many of us are joining online, but at the same time, uh, to really see your faces uh, and to be in the same place, to worship the Lord, uh, yeah, it's a little bit emotional. And um, I, I'm just so thankful uh, that uh, God is bringing our hearts together uh, to worship. And we know that wherever we may be, whether we are physically in this building or whether you're joining us through Zoom or through YouTube live stream, uh, God is so blessed and so delighted in our heart of worship. Uh, and so we really want to encourage us uh, to continue to seek that intimacy with the Lord uh, as we continue to love on Him as He has loved uh, us. Uh, let me read... Uh, Today's text, Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. <clears throat> I know that this is a passage that we are very familiar with. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their own homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. <clears throat> And we know that this is the first glimpse of the church and the community that rose out of the church. And as you know, Jerusalem was a huge city. And the you know, rest of the Israel, they didn't have the privilege of people who lived in Jerusalem did. Jerusalem had one thing going, is that they had the temple. And so people who lived near Jerusalem, you know, near the temple, they could actually walk to the temple to pray, and they would have the 6 a.m. prayer, they would have the 9 a.m. prayer, 12 p.m. prayer, and 3 p.m. prayer, and so they would walk there and during the course of the day, and then they would pray. And after praying, they would usually go to Solomon's porch, and, uh, and then they would gather there, and usually an apostle would proclaim the gospel, do a sermon, and then after having received the message and hearing the word of God, and that they would come home together, and as it is being described here, they didn't just go back to their homes, but they went home together. Another family, uh, two families, three families would gather, and then after they had gathered, they would eat together, they would share about what they heard, what they received, their prayer requests, and then they would spend time together as a community of God. And out of this, God was doing miraculous things. He was adding to their number daily, people were being saved, uh, people were being healed, people were being set free, and people were coming to know Jesus Christ and maturing in the Lord. And so we see that at the first, very first glimpse of the church, God had designed the church to become the community. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, in his book, uh, Life Together, he talks about the importance of being able to have a relationship with Jesus Christ by yourself. This is really important. But at the same time, he also stresses the importance of being part of the community. Right? So he, he writes, uh, to those who cannot be alone, he says, you have to be weary of the community. He says, he will only do harm to himself and to the community. Alone you stood before God when he called you. Alone you had to answer that call. Alone you had to struggle and pray. And alone you will die and give an account to God. You cannot escape from yourself, for God has singled you out. If you refuse to be alone, you are rejecting God's call to you, and you can have no part in the community of those who are called. The challenge of death comes to us all, and no one can die for another Everyone must fight his own battle with death by himself alone. 
I will not be with you then, nor you with me. Right? So it talks about having that personal relationship with God, and you cannot just hide in the community like, well, rest of the community is worshiping, rest of the community loves the Lord, rest of the community is serving one another, so I can just kind of go along with them, and I don't really need to have a genuine relationship with God because I'm just part of this church, and that is a very, very dangerous mindset. But at the same time, he challenges, let him who is not in the community be aware of being alone, right? Into the community you were called. The call was not meant for you alone. In the community of the called, you bear your cross. You struggle, you pray. You are not alone, even in death. And on the last day, you will be only one member of the great congregation of Jesus Christ. If you scorn the fellowship of the brethren, you reject the call of Jesus Christ, and thus your solitude can only be hurtful to you. If I die, then I am not alone in death. If I suffer, the fellowship suffer with me. Right? And, and so what we see here is that it is of utmost importance. Our salvation is dependent upon our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Yes. But at the same time, God did not call us to be islands. God did not call us and said, you only need to have a relationship with me and that is it. No, he called us to be part of his church. We make up the body of Jesus Christ. And so, even in Genesis chapter 1, and he's talking about creating man, Genesis 1.26, he says, let us make man in our own image. Right? So God is already showing to us that the triune God already has a community and God is working within the community of Trinity of God. And so he says, let us make our own image and in our form, let us make man. And you know, God delighted in all that he's created. Right? Every day he said, it was good, it was good. And when he saw man, it was very good. But there's one time when God said, it's not good. When was that? When Adam was discovered to be alone, and God said, it is not good for man to be alone, right? And God is not simply saying he must get married. No, God is saying you need to be in a community. You were designed to thrive in the context of community. And, you know, we, we read the news, right? We watch what is going on, and we know that ever since the lockdowns have taken place, it, you know, the, the, the depression, the, the murder, the, the drug overdose, the suicide, uh, you know, physical abuse of children and spouse has more than doubled. More than doubled because that is the pressure we have when we are isolated. Uh, we have no community to restrain us or keep us accountable or to relieve that pressure or, or, or that, you know, fear and, and, and hopelessness that just like, powering over you, and when you feel like you're alone and you're left to fend for yourself, we make damaging, we make critical mistakes and choices that are very hurtful to those around us. Right? Even as the schools are really struggling to reopen, you know, like uh, the opening of New York schools have been postponed. Like Jedi is like, when do I get to go to school? <laughs> Just sick of not doing anything. And we already got another email, like, oh, we, we might be delayed again. You know, and you know, kids are like, initially they're like, yay, school's, you know, school's delayed, I don't have to go to school. But now they're like, oh, please, not another delay. Let me go to school, you know? Uh, and even as all this is going on, like, Jedi School is doing something uh, very interesting, right? Uh, you can choose to do everything online, or you can have a blended model where you can come to school for a couple days a week. But teachers are refusing to come to school, so when you come to school, you're going to learn online. <laughs> right? So you come to school to be on Zoom to you know, learn from your teacher. So we're like, so why do you go to school <laughs> to watch online when you can watch at home? But for some students, that's the situation at home. 
They need to come out of that place to be relieved of the pressure and the bitterness and the anger and the hurt that is just swirling around in that household. Parents are filled with fear, frustration. Uh, you know, those of you with young children, you know the pressure of being with your child 24-7. One of the biggest fights a, a couple with a new child has when uh, you know, the wife is a stay-at-home mom is this. Wife is all day wrestling with a child and waiting, waiting for the husband to come home so that she can be relieved of the child to get some rest. But then the husband, when he comes home, what is he thinking? I work like a dog all day. All I want to do is sit back in my couch and have a drink and watch football. Can you just leave me alone? And wife is like, what are you talking about? You think I ate bonbons all day? It's tiring being a mom. Take over. And husband's like, I worked all day. Please, I need to rest. And that's where the conflict is because it is so draining to be cooped up in the house with a child, and you know, moms do their best to take them to the playground, have play dates, and you know, send them to you know, pre K, whatever, but that is not happening. With this COVID virus, everybody's stuck at home. And little children, they can only watch so many hours of screen. They, they, they're restless, they're not going to sit there. And so, all this pressure is mounting. Same thing with young adults. Those of you who are students or singles, you know, you're working and you're alone and you don't have that community to share, someone to listen to your story, kind of pat you on the shoulder like, hey, I'm going through something similar too, man. You know, let's pray together. Can I pray for you? You know, let's share a meal and let's just kind of sit and commiserate. That's not such a terrible thing. You know, I had a... Uh, I've been having a lot of conversations with Pastor Young lately, and the last time I talked to him, and we were sharing, and, and then Pastor Young was like, hey, Joe, we're so good. We're so good at making each other feel terrible. <laughs> and, you know, that was kind of a joke, but half true. You know, we shared, like, all our struggles and, you know, uh, frustrations of ministry and the circumstances. But, see, we didn't end there. Yeah, I, you know, we shared, but then we pray that, God, we're going through this, and this is our difficulty, and this is our concern, and this is our fear. Lord, can you help us? Will you help us? And so I really want to talk to you uh, about the calling that God has on his people, on his church, and that is for us to belong to the community of believers, right? So the way it happened in Jerusalem church is that uh, they belonged to Oikos church. Now, they didn't have their own church building, right? So they would gather on Sundays, probably like at Solomon's porch, and all the believers would gather, and, you know, Peter or, you know, John, you know, they would probably do a sermon and worship outdoors, but after that, they would go home, and oikos literally means family, right? Oikos is family, and so it's like family church. And so within that context of two families, three families, four families gathering, the idea is that you know everybody. idea is that you get to know everybody, you get to know their story, you get to know their circumstances, and you care deeply, you love deeply, and you contend for one another, you intercede on one another's behalf, and become a family of God. And this is so crucial, right? We need to be invested into, committed into being the family of God that God has called us to be. When we are an island, there's no need to stir up all that is within us. You know, whether you're selfish, whether you're insecure, these things don't show up when you're alone. You know, when, when, when you're by yourself, you do not try to get your own attention. Like, hey, hey, Joe, look at me. Joe, listen to me. No. When does that insecurity come out? When you're in front of other people. When you're sharing. 
Like, right? Like, are they listening to me? Are they agreeing with me? Are they sympathizing with me? And so, you know, when you have a small group and discussion, you know some people will always try to dominate or always try to exert a certain view. Like, come on, guys. Isn't this true? Don't you agree with me? Like, shouldn't we be doing this? Or like some guys like just really focused on like eating everything inside, you know, like eat and eat. And we have these various things that is pushed to the forefront when you're with other people. And I want to tell you, the hallmark of being a true, mature Christian it's not found in, you know, are you doing your QT every day? Did you tithe? Do you come to Sunday service? You know, do you, did you go on a short-term mission trip? You know, things like that are great and wonderful, but that's not the litmus test. The litmus test, guys, is this. Are you able to live in harmony with other brothers and sisters who are different from you? That's where we have problems, right? That's where we have trouble, Right? And so if you like point A, but if someone says, no, point A is not right, I like point B, then we have a problem. Because, oh, you are disagreeing with me, so in you disagreeing with me, you are against me. Right? And so Romans 12, verse 16, Paul says this, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position do not be conceited, right? And so, you know, we naturally think, wow, this is my understanding, and I am enlightened to have this understanding, but, you know, you are down here, you know, and so, like, I look down on you. Like, Pastor, when Pastor Johan was here, and then I would have, like, you know, lunch with him or something, and I would look down on Johan because he had a gas grill, right? I'm like, gas grill? You barbecue with gas grill? Come on, man. You got to use real charcoal. And, you know, you want like, Pastor Joe, I know you look down on me, but this is good enough for me. Right? And I'm like, you're so sad. You're so sad. Right? Uh, and sometimes, and I'm kidding, right? <laughs> but, but sometimes that's how we treat one another. Wow, you're not a vegetarian? Or like, you're not a pescatorian yet? You know, like, things like that. And then, like, you're, you're so barbaric. How can you eat that stuff? And, and in so doing, having a different position, we've, we elevate ourselves. <clears throat> but Paul says, hey, even if you disagree, do not be conceited, but be willing to associate with people of low position or lower ideas. Don't be proud. And ultimately, he says, live in harmony with one another. See, being in the community, it will be more difficult. It will be more troublesome. It will require you to exert more effort and energy and passion. Because to get along, in order to get along, there will be friction. And the oil that lubricates that friction is the presence of God and the grace of God and the love of God. If you are isolated, you will not have any friction. And you will think, I'm pretty good. I am pretty loving. I am pretty understanding. That's what we all think. Until you have a run-in with somebody who has a bone to pick with you. Right? You think you're very, oh, I'm a team player. You know, I, I, I follow orders really well. And, you know, I don't have an issue with authority. And then you go get a job, and you have a crazy boss who changes her mind every other day. And even as you are doing the work that she told you to do, in the middle of it, she's like, no, I changed my mind. Start over. And you're like, I hate her. God, please, strike her with lightning. You know, like, you thought you were so loving, so understanding, so patient, but when you start dealing with difficult, problematic people, you realize, wow, I'm not that patient. I'm not that kind. I'm actually pretty self-centered. And Jesus is not saying, avoid people, because when you encounter people, 
those negative traits, sinful traits of yours is going to come out and it's not going to look good. So just kind of keep to yourself. No, Jesus is the opposite. You need to have run-ins with people. You need to interact with people and see what kind of stuff really comes out because I want to show you these things because it is my desire to bring cleansing, bring healing, and to bring maturation and deepening of your understanding of my love and my heart and my forgiveness and healing for your life. Some people say, Pastor Joe, the reason I don't go to small group is because I don't like conflicts. And when I go, I end up judging people. I end up hating people. And so I don't go. But see, that's the exact reason why you should go and really struggle before God. Like, God, I, I, I find myself judging, condemning. And where is this heart coming from? Right? Maybe it's coming from the wound that you have when you felt rejected, when you felt betrayed, when you felt looked down upon by other circumstances in your life. Church life, small group life, let me tell you, is designed to be messy. It's supposed to be messy. If it's clean and sterile, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. You're not being real. You know, I have a somewhat of a green thumb. You know, I'm okay, but I'm not excellent like some people I know. But there is a, a secret that I know. If you want to have a green thumb, okay, never kill a plant, I tell you the secret. Buy fake plants. Fake plants never die. Okay? You don't have to water them. You don't have to worry about it. They just remain bloomed. But you know it's not real. You know it's not real. Same thing. In your small group, in your community, if there's no conflict, no strife, no argument, no disagreement, because everybody is putting out this Christian front, we have the facade, and we are all well-mannered, I have no problems in life. Yeah, you will not have any problems and your small group will be very, very tidy and not messy. But I'm here to tell you, that's very artificial. That's very sterile. It's designed to be messy because we're sinful people. We're broken people. And when we start to bring out stuff, oh man, it's terrible. I have a friend, I have many dentist friends, and, uh, and then I have one surgeon friend. And so my dentist friends, you know, they're, we're joking. And like, you know, being a dentist is one of the most terrible jobs because people be having some stanky breath, right? Like, they open their, they're like, can you please tell people to brush their mouth before they come to see the dentist? Because it's like so painful, right? And then my surgeon friend's like, yeah, I can see that, but have you ever cut open someone's stomach? You know how bad that smells? I have no idea, but according to the surgeon, it's like really foul, right? Like, like sometimes it takes everything in you to not vomit, okay? Because it's just the gas and everything is so terrible. But that's what's inside, literally, physically, and spiritually, right? Spiritually and emotionally, there are parts of us that are wounded and broken and, and, and damaged by sinful people and sinful things. And, and when you expose these things, it's going to be messy. It's going to be smelly. But the grace of God is that God is willing to heal. God is willing to cleanse. God is willing to restore and strengthen. Our Christian lives, it's not lived only during Sunday service. Sunday worship is so precious. This is a privilege that we have to come together in one heart and one faith and one confession to praise the Lord together and nothing can replace this. Very, very powerful, yes. But our everyday life that is lived, to be lived out before the Lord where our true self is really being surfaced through 
uh, relationships and circumstances, right? It, it's just coming out, and God says, I want to deal with those areas of your life. I want to deal with your insecurity. I want to deal with your fear. I want to deal uh, with your lust, your sinfulness, your brokenness. And God says, I want to deal with those areas of your life with people who know you, who love you, who are content for you, and who will fight with you. See, a true community, when your flaw is exposed, does not condemn you. A true community, when your flaw is exposed, they come around you, they surround you, and cover your shame and help you to overcome. One time I took a team of college students to Mongolia. And you know, Mongolia literally looks like that Windows 98 background. It's just like lots and lots of planes and no trees and nowhere to hide. And when you're driving hours and hours, you know, after a while you have to use the restroom, but there's nothing, there's nothing. And so brothers would go like 50 yards down that way and sisters would go like 50 yards down that way and there are no trees or anything. So like we literally had to form a human shield and everybody took turns behind that shield doing their thing. Right? And I was like so blessed. Right? Like, this is the picture of true community. Right? Like we're, we're not going, oh, what are you doing? But we're like, you got to do what you got to do. But you know what? We stand in front of you. We cover your shame and we help you overcome. Right? And and believe me, sometimes it wasn't just number one, okay? <laughs> and it's hard. And when you are in a community where you're deathly afraid of your community finding out who you really are, then there is something unhealthy. Either that's how you view your community or more seriously, maybe the community has not truly learned to love you the way you are, right? If somebody comes to us in your small group and says, guys, I have a, I don't know, gambling problem and drug addiction problem, and we immediately say, get out, Satan. We don't want you here. We don't want your kind. Okay, that's a terrible community to be a part of, right? No, we have to cry with them. We have to intercede and fight. And how can we help you? How can we help you to be set free from this addiction and to really be the child of God that God has created you to be? See, we have to be willing to stand together. And I'm not saying we tolerate sin, okay? That's not the issue. So like, let me touch upon a very sensitive issue. And some of you might get mad at me, but I'm just teaching the Bible, okay? I believe, according to the Bible, abortion is wrong, okay? And so we can, we can say that and we can uh, tell somebody who is considering abortion to not do that. We can do that. But let's say in her despair and in her, in her much thinking and struggle, she did choose to go ahead with the abortion and she had it done. The telltale sign of whether we are a true community of God or not is what happens after. Do we condemn her, kick her out, and reject her because she's such a sinner? Or even after she made that choice, do we still choose to stand with her, help her overcome, to be healed, to be reconciled, to be uh, shed of that guilt, of that shame? And we love her nonetheless. You see? It's not wrong to call sin, sin. But it is very wrong for the church to condemn the sinner and reject the sinner. That's not how the gospel operates in our lives, and neither should it to people who come to us. And so, Paul makes it very clear that the unity, right? Unity is so important. So that in the previous verse that I read in Romans 12, 16, he says, live in 
harmony with one another. Live in harmony with one another. And so that it's not saying sing in unison, right? You guys know the difference between singing in unison and singing in harmony. Singing in unison is you all make the same note. But, you know, our, our worship team, like Michelle and Robin and like, you know, Myra and Ed, when they sing, and we have other singers like Michelle, and like, they sing different tunes, but they're in harmony, you see. You, can, you don't have to always sound the same. You can have a different sound. You can have a different opinion. You can be in different stage of maturity in your walk with Jesus Christ. But Paul says, live in harmony by accepting, by loving, by embracing. This is so important. And this will not happen when you are outside of the fellowship, outside of the community. No other time in my life do I feel like the community of God is so important. Like this is not something we can do without. You know, we are under such a burden of everything that is going on. with it. You guys see the news, right? Doesn't your heart just feel like heavy? Like almost like, I don't want to watch the news anymore. The fires that are raging, you know, the, the civil unrest at the, at the systematic racism and the protest and, and, and the political divide between, you know, is, is it Republican or is, is it, you know, Democrat and, and the I think the pushback of whatever is going to happen after November election, well, we need to be praying for this nation. We really need to be praying. I mean, there's so many things that are going on right now, you know, between natural calamity to social unrest, political unrest, and, and not even talking about coronavirus. And we know that this thing is going to be with us, as the scientists are telling us, probably till end of 2021, not 2020. Right? And in this kind of circumstances and situations, will you choose to be alone? Will you choose to be disconnected? Will you choose to suffer and be in despair by yourself, thinking to yourself, no one cares, no one knows what I'm going through, no one understands me? Or will you be brave? And will you be obedient and say, God, I want to be part of the community that you allow me to be in. And they may not be perfect. They may not be mature at all times. But I will allow them to make mistakes. I will allow them to have a misstep or two but I will choose to love, I will choose to forgive. As much as you desire the community to forgive you and to accept you, we have to allow ourselves to forgive and accept those in my community who are different, who are shortcoming in their reach of trying to be the right person. Ephesians 4.3, Paul says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Galatians 3, it says, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And it's talking about a powerful unity, that there is no difference because of your nationality or your race or your, your public position or your possession or your education. It's not any of those things. What matters is, do we belong to Jesus Christ? And if we belong to Jesus Christ, then we are co-heirs with Jesus Christ. That's what makes us united. It's not whether you're Presbyterian or you're Baptist or you're Pentecostal. 
That's not what draws the line. No. Paul says, we are made one. And we need to make every, unit, uh, every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And so, you know, as we are going through this season, and you guys know that we've been announcing the sign-ups for small groups, and, you know, for the leaders, it's actually a less headache if we have less people. <laughs> if we have more people, it's hard to contain, hard to, hard to control, hard to minister. But see, I really, really believe that a church life cannot be lived out without being part of church community in our everyday life context. We cannot be merely Sunday worship-oriented church. Come to church on Sunday, have a great service, love the Lord, everybody go home and live the life where you want to live for the rest of the week. And come back next Sunday and do it all over again. That's not walking with God. Walking with God is you come and you love the Lord and you glorify Him with all that He's done for you the past week. And then once you hit outside the building of this church, you start living your everyday life with your community. Whatever your struggle, whatever your fears, whatever your prayer requests, whatever is storming within you, you share that with your peers. You share that with your community. And you pray together, you, you contend together, and share how God has answered. And it doesn't always have to be, wow, God answered my prayer with a yes. I asked for the job and I got the job, praise the Lord. But sometimes you can share, you know, guys, that prayer request I shared with you. Thank you for praying, but God answered with a no. And I'm kind of devastated. But I know that he has a reason, and I know that he's doing something through this season. So can you continue to pray for me? That I will not be so dismayed, that I will not be so hopeless, but that even in this answer that God has given me, I can continue to love him and trust him. Right? Our real life, real faith, has to be lived out in the context of community. Yes, as I stated in the beginning, your personal relationship with Jesus Christ cannot be replaced by you hiding in your community. That's very dangerous. Just because you go to a spirit-filled church and everyone loves the Lord, don't kid yourself if you don't have a relationship with God, that God is going to somehow allow you in. That's not how it works. It is personal. It is a personal relationship. However, if you have that personal relationship with God, God is inviting you to be part of the community. And some of you might be thinking like, well, Pastor Joe, I know that people with problems should go to community because they need help, but I don't have a problem. I'm like, pretty good. I'm pretty put together and I don't have a major prayer request. Like my company loves me. I just got a raise and life is good, Pastor Joe. All the more reason why you should go to be an encouragement, to go and serve, to go and minister because even if you may not have the need, but even as you serve, God adds grace upon grace. But God, Pastor Joe, I, I don't even like people. Like, I don't care for people. You know why you don't care for people? Because you don't know them. But once you know them, and you get to know their story, if you truly know them, you love them. To know me is to love me, right? Like, our boys, we, we try to teach them Korean. They're not interested. They don't want to learn Korean, you know. But, you know, we did make them watch this Korean learning DVD for a season, and so they know kind of how to barely read and write. But they're not interested in learning Korean. Well, Hannah asked Jeremy, my second son, you know, mommy's doing this Korean school. Can you help me? Yeah, can you, like, tutor, like, help watch over these kids so they can read and, you know, like, properly? And Jeremy's like, well, 
I'm not interested in learning Korean, but I'm willing to help you. I don't care about teaching Korean, but I'm willing to help you. So Jeremy came with mommy to help other kids, you know, read and write Korean. And you know what happened? He became so good in reading and writing Korean because he was helping these kids. And so before, like when Hannah and I had some things that we needed to talk about, serious stuff that we didn't want our kids to know, we would talk to each other in Korean. But now Jeremy's like, I know what you're saying. We're like, go to your room, <laughs> right? Uh, but see, he was not interested, but because he was helping and giving and serving, it became a blessing to him. Many of you think, I'm not very pastoral, I'm not very ministry-minded. It's because you haven't done it. You haven't experienced the joy of loving somebody. You haven't experienced the joy of seeing somebody be encouraged, be set free, to overcome. And many times the reason you don't care about that person is because you don't know that person deep enough. You know why movie directors spend so so much time on character development? It's because they want you to care about this character. Because this character is going to do some dumb things. He's going to you know, go back to jail like, or, or get caught doing drugs again or go back into gang. And, and if you don't know the person, you're like, what a thug. Why am I watching this movie? But through the character development, if you know his background and if you know his history and if you know his struggle, your heart is tied to this guy and you cheer for him, you cry for him in the course of an hour and a half. Yes, there are people in our lives who can annoy you, who can rub you the wrong way. But I'm here to contend with you to say that many times you're annoyed because you don't really know him well enough. You didn't really take time to get to know this person's story, struggle, their fears. And if you truly know that, you would be more compassionate, more understanding, more patient. We are called to be the light of this world. And we cannot have a powerful light that is admitted when we are alone. But even if what we have is a match light, even if what we have is a candle light, when these things come together, the synergy of the lights coming together is powerful. And so as we start this season, and you know, we're about to start our small groups, I pray as your pastor, especially during this season of being sheltered in and not being able to see the friends. and We need to be part of the small group. We need to belong to the true community and family of God. Make it your discipline. Make it your passion. Make it your priority to join a family of God. Get to know them. Have them get to know you, be real, be genuine, right? Because nobody really wants to be real. Nobody really wants to expose themselves for who they are. That's why we say stuff like, for real, man, I'm being real right now. But usually when you say you're being real, you're not real, right? It's like, truthfully, like, I'm being real right now. You know, it's because we, ex- so many time, we experience so many times people are not being real. Well, community of God is where you can be real. And community of God is where, as you're being real, there is genuine compassion. There's genuine love and genuine desire to draw you closer to the Lord who can truly heal, who can truly set free, cleanse and forgive.